So, um, uh, welcome for today's workshop. Um, I'm very happy to be here and hold a workshop um, in the Glory Stata Center of the MIT. Um, the topic um, I'm talking about today is um, not just any topic for me, it's one of my very favorites. And um, it's hopefully, uh, it's part of my hopefully soon finished uh, PhD thesis. So the title is Using Neural ODEs in Real Life Applications. And <clears throat> I will give a more detailed introduction to Neural ODEs soon. For now, um, Neural ODEs were introduced in 2018 and are a method for dynamic system modeling. So I first read about them in Christmas 2020 and I was like, this is so cool. Um, let's check out what people are doing with Neural ODEs now. And there were indeed a bunch of interesting papers, um, but if you took a closer look, um, you um, saw that most applications were solved in a very specialized way or with assumptions um, that are far away from real um, engineering applications. So, um, for example, the systems are smooth um, in real life um, engineering. We often have discontinuous systems. <clears throat> So soon after I found out that neural ODs existed, um, I was a little bit disappointed that, did, that they didn't made it um, into real life engineering application. So I asked myself, um, why is this? Um, is this because there are much better ways of modeling dynamical systems? Uh, probably because there are many cool new methods, but I think the main reason is far more obvious. Um, they just don't work out of the box. Um, so, cool results, we have very cool results for toy examples or for academic use cases, but um, it's very hard and requires uh, many additional steps to get good results in real life applications. So, the goal for today is um, struggling with these challenges and finding this, these ominous um, additional steps during working on a real life engineering use case. So, um, 60 seconds about the guys speaking. Um, I'm here together with my boss, Lars Mikkelsons, um, which is the head of chair, the chair of mechatronics um, at the uh, University of Augsburg. And um, he will yeah. introduce himself a little. Um, you know, why are we doing this? I uh, part of my career in industry, that is that Bosch, uh, doesn't know what uh, relevant problems look like. Um, they look different than academic uh, examples. And so the goal of our chair is to make uh, cool stuff, cool methods work with real problems. Um, that is exactly what uh, this workshop is about. And um, yeah, the stage is yours. <laughs> Thanks. So um, my name is Tobias Fumara. Let's move this. My name is Tobias Tumara, and as already teasered, I'm working as PhD student at the Chair of Mechatronics. And um, what I, am I doing the whole day? Um, working on finding good solutions and um, gener generalizable methods for neural ODE applications. So the agenda for today is only some kind of um, guess because it's a workshop and we are very flexible as long as we don't exceed our time slot. Um, we will start with an introduction on white box modeling, black box modeling, and hybrid, uh, hybrid modeling with neural ODEs. Um, we will face some challenges. Um, we will talk about topology, interfacing, stabiliza stabilization, batching, and of course we will do some coding. Um, then we will have a look um, on the results of the trained model and we will finish with a short conclusion and a free discussion. So um, I like placing uh, sticky notes in my presentations um, that um, conclude some best practices um, that might be useful. So the first best practice for today is um, please ask questions as soon as they arise um, because it's a workshop and not a keynote. Um, so don't hesitate um, to ask questions questions if they can be answered um, quickly 
if you have uh, input for longer discussions like um, I hate neural ODEs, um, then please ask them at the very end in the discussion slot. Um, so the slides and the code is available for download. Um, the URL, you find the URL here. And um, everything we are doing today and everything we are doing research is um, open source, so we don't need any special tools or something like that. So let's get started. <clears throat> As promised, um, we check out the use case for today. Um, we are doing some very basic introduction to white box, black box, and hybrid modeling, or you might also know it as gray box modeling. And um, we will introduce the use software and do a first little code snippet together. So um, I'm from Bavaria, um, so I brought a real South German engineering use case um, with me. Um, I think we are still most famous for our car brands, um, Mercedes-Benz, Audi, um, BMW, and Porsche. Um, so for today, we are modeling engineers um, at our very favorite brand. So um, you can pick one um, in your mind if you want. And um, everything we need is some work. So um, my first idea was um, we should predict um, some NOx emissions uh, for diesel engines because you might have heard that there were some problems um, when it comes to prediction of NOx. Um, but I decided to took a more up-to-date example um, the prediction of the energy consumption for an electric vehicle. It's an eSmart for two if you're interested in the specific model. So um, as you can imagine, doing good consumption prediction is very important um, because how far can I drive with uh, this car? So our job for today is um, we, um, we want to build a vehicle simulation model um, that makes good predictions um, on the energy consumption um, that is basically, uh, that, that is physically correct. So it's, um, it should act like we expect it um, to act. And because we need to stay economic, um, we need to train the whole thing on little data because data requires prototypes and experiments and is therefore very expensive. So the least data, the better. So um, this is only an example. And what we do today, today is not restricted um, to this use case but usable for a variety of use cases. Um, and I will give you some um, other examples at the very end. Um, so that's our job. Where's the data coming from? Um, as said, real measurements are expensive, um, but we need them. Um, we don't need much data, but we need a little data. Um, so we have a real uh, vehicle, a vehicle on a dynamometer testing bench. Um, and we are taking a driving cycle, and today it's the WLTC driving cycle. Um, you might know it from media or the advertisement for your next um, um, electric car. So um, the driving cycle is basically nothing but a velocity, uh, velocity profile over time. Um, so we have a given target velocity and uh, drive it as accurate as possible. And of course, we're not driving by ourselves, um, but computer is driving for us. So um, during the maneuver, uh, we are measuring the vehicle energy consumption at the battery. Um, for a better understanding, uh, we have a look on the measurements. So on the left, um, we have the first 40% of the WLTC driving cycle. So that's the so-called city part, um, where we are driving with speeds up to 30 meters per second. Um, which is around 30 MPH um, in American units. So um, on the right, we have the corresponding energy consumption in watt seconds. And to keep it interesting, we only do two runs and measure the first 40% um, of WLTC, like in this point, uh, like in this plot. Um, this is our training data. Um, after that, we do a full measurement, so on the entire WLTC driving cycle, on the remaining 60%, and keep them aside during development, and we use that for validation later. Um, as a little teaser, um, 
the entire cycle is driving higher velocities. Um, so the model will have to show how good it, it is able to extrapolate on unknown data. Um, by the way, um, this experiment was not performed by us, um, but our colleagues from the Technical University in Munich. Um, you find the sources in the in the linked um, in the yeah in the linked paper. Um, at this point, thank you very much for sharing this um, experiment. So, what do we expect our model to do? Um, well, exactly the same. Um, we want a model that predicts the cumulative consumption um, based on a given vehicle velocity. So a model that can predict the vehicle consumption for different velocity profiles. Um, this is a cool goal, but how can we get there? Well, um, life is hard and we need to make some tough decisions. Um, the first one is how do we want to model? Um, on the left side, we have the physical modeling approach you might know as modeling with physical equations or white box modeling. Um, physical modeling is physically correct. So we use equations that were proven um, over centuries to, to describe dynamic systems. So it's basically the best tested modeling approach we have. Um, on the other hand, such models are always built on assumptions and assumptions lead to simplifications in the structure and therefore modeling errors. Um, so they are often small, but um, they are present. As a consequence um, of using these physical, uh, physical equations, we have a very intuitive understanding of what parameters mean. So um, we know how they influence the system. And as long as we are not violating the assumptions we made during the model development, for example, um, in mechanical systems, we are far away from the speed of light. Um, we extrapolate quite well. So in general, our system model is valid for a wide range of unknown inputs. On the other hand, um, we have the data-driven approach um, where we fit a more or less universal model um, on data. So um, this basically only looks good. Um, we will show what that means in the upcoming slide. Um, interestingly, um, we can be as accurate as we want. Um, so think of an ANN um, that fits data. If we converge and have still a deviation, we can use a larger artificial neural network and train it for longer to become even better. So a big downside of this approach is that there's no intuitive understanding of parameters. So um, sure, we have these nice explanations for convolutional neural networks understanding images, um, but um, we cannot predict as a human how changing a single parameter influences um, our system. So I have no intuitive understanding. We could make sensitivity anal analysis and such, uh, such things, but um, we have no intuitive understanding of what happens. So um, another problem, and the last one, is um, extrapolation is often not very good. So um, everything is nice as soon as we are inside of our known input space, but as soon as we um, leave it, um, we can dras drastically become um, much worse. Um, so Finally, both approaches are modeled by different domain experts. Um, the physical models are designed by um, physical or scientific engineers um, that have a great understanding in physics, um, but to be honest, often a quite decent understanding of machine learning. And on the other hand, the data-driven approach um, is modeled by machine learning engineers um, that are very good um, in training different types of models, but are often, um, have often just a little knowledge in physical modeling. So um, we need to decide physical or data-driven modeling. Um, because it's the traditional way of modeling, uh, we start with the physical modeling approach. <clears throat> So probably the first shot a uh, um, classical simulation engineer would do is build an ODE system. So um, handling large systems of equations um, is a bit bulky. 
So we are using modeling tools for this. Um, they have a nice graphical user interface um, for model development and the ODE generation is done as soon as I click on translate or compile over. Um, because the focus for today is not on, um, on modeling and modeling tools, I have a ready to use simulation model with me. Um, this model is called a vehicle longitudinal dynamics model um, because it only describes the vehicle dynamics um, on one axis, so the driving direction of the vehicle. This model is not able to do turns so similar, it's just driving on a straight line. Um, this is because for consumption prediction, um, doing turns is often neglected because of its very, very, very low impact on the energy consumption. We are talking about slow turns here. Um, so, um, so such models can easily be built um, with, for example, object-oriented modeling languages like Modelica, or we have modeling toolkit in Modia in Julia here, and um, subdivide in six basic parts. So we have the driving cycle. This is nothing but the WLTC in our use case. Um, we have the driver, um, which is basically a controller that tries to drive the given velocity from the driving cycle. Um, we have a vehicle control unit. Um, we have the drivetrain, which includes some gears and the electric motor. We have the power source, which delivers power for, uh, for the electric motor. And last but not least, the vehicle dynamics um, that describe the car momentum and resistance like um, rolling friction and air friction and so on. So this system um, has a closed, con uh, a closed, is closed loop controlled. Um, so um, the driver is acting through the control unit and the drivetrain on basis of the vehicle dynamics. Um, to conclude, um, this is not a beginner's model. So um, we have characteristic maps, um, controllers as said, um, discontinuities, non-linearities, and um, hysteresis curves. Um, so before we can watch simulation results of this model, um, there's another little step we need to do. Um, let's keep in mind that this is after we click the compile button uh, in ODE system, and ODEs um, map for a given system state uh, map a given system state on a system state derivative. Um, so if I want to retrieve a solution, I need to solve for x, and for this I need an ODE solver. And an ODE solver is nothing but an advanced algorithm for numerical integration, for efficient numerical integration. So after I solve for the next x, which is x, plus, uh, x at t plus h, we can close the loop put this X back in and do as many simulation steps as we want. So paired with an ODE solver, um, we can check the results of our simulation model. So let's check out how the physical model performs. Um, we put in our um, first 40% of the WLTC driving cycle and retrieve a solution, our cumulative energy consumption. And if you are comparing data, data is blue, and uh, the simulation results in orange, we see, uh, well, th this is really not that bad. Um, we have only a very small deviation here. Um, so this deviation is a real modeling error um, that happened during model development of this model. Um, the, uh, this model was developed by very good simulation engineers, um, so this is nothing artificial induced or similar just for this workshop, it's a real model. Um, so let's check this on testing data. So on the full WLTC driving cycle that we did not use during development of this model. So our input is now the complete 100% um, of the WLTC. And of course we assume that these results are very good too because the physical equations for modeling are valid for the longer driving cycle as well. 
because um, even if e cars are fast as hell, we are still far away from the speed of light. So this should be working too. And indeed, um, the results are very nice. Um, on the entire driving cycle, we still have a very small deviation. So actually a good start into our modeling challenge and a hard to top start. Um, so can we do it any better with a simple data-driven approach? Um, let's check this out. So we start by using a plain feed-forward, fully connected artificial neural network with a simple job. I give you a driving cycle as input, you, and um, you give me the vehicle consumption, the vehicle, the cumulative vehicle energy consumption as state x on the output side. So additionally, additionally one have to um, do some minor adjustments um, to get this working, but um, this is not the focus for today, so we just check out um, what is being learned. So um, as the same as for the physical model, um, we give the first 30% of the WLTC and check the cumulative consumption prediction of the model. And well, it's, it's not totally bad. Um, the A and N is orange, the data is in blue, um, but as far, uh, far, as far as not good as the physical model. Um, in fact, one could improve this fit, um, as already stated, by using a larger artificial neural network or a deeper neural network or train it for longer. But far more important is the next slide. Um, on testing data set, if we are using the full WLTC, um, which includes unknown data, so we are driving higher velocities. Um, this leads to very disappointing results. Um, as soon as we are leaving um, the known data region, uh, which um, finished at around 600 seconds. The curve doesn't uh, the curve doesn't react anymore, um, so we have just a flat line. Um, our model is basically dead. Um, and to be honest, at this point we had luck. Um, often the trajectory diverges to plus or minus infinity um, for untrained regions. So a flat line seems quite of okay in this case. So um, let's conclude our first steps with a data-driven approach. Um, we find out that basically it works um, as long as we are staying inside um, our known data region. Um, extrapolation is in general quite bad. Um, also, tr we are training fixed time steps into our um, neural network. So if I feed the ANN with inputs that were sampled with um, one sample per second, I get outputs um, with a sampling frequency of one sample per second. And if I want to use a, um, some other sampling frequency uh, tomorrow, I will get um, unexpected results um, if I ignore this. So um, there are multiple ways to enhance the extrapolation um, capability here. We have um, RNNs, LSTMs, residual neural networks, physics-informed neural networks, um, but today we are focusing on my very favorite one of them, and that's the neural ODE. If you recall the simulation of an ODE system, um, so we have a given system state X, put it into the ODE, the ODE computes um, the system state derivative X dot, and the ODE solver integrates it into the next system state at T plus H. Um, why? not replacing the ODE here with an artificial neural network. Um, so not an ANN that predicts the system state, but one that predicts the system state derivative. <clears throat> um, neural ODEs were introduced um, in 2018, so this is a neural ODE. And um, since then there were many improvements like um, for more efficient sensitivities, um, by the guys from Julia Computing, like Chris Rakaukas and Dickie Kuflux and so on. Um, the advantage of neural ODEs is, um, so there's an advantage and disadvantage. The advantage is if you want to learn a dynamical system, um, you don't need to learn the dynamics and the numerical integration, um, but you learn only the dynamics itself, so the right-hand side of the ODE, basically. Um, numerical integration, on the other hand, is performed 
by an algorithm that is far, far better when it comes to numerical integration than any, than, than any artificial neural network. Um, further, we have, oh, sorry, further we have other advantages like um, for now, we can do um, dynamic step size control during solving um, the SODE system. And um, we could even use another solver for training um, the system and infer, uh, in, in evaluating it later. So we can um, exchange the solver basically. So the disadvantage is um, this is not as easy to train as a plain neural network um, because we, if we want to train um, on the ODE solution X here, um, we need to differentiate through the ODE solver and um, yeah, the good news is um, there are different ways to differentiate um, over a solver. There are many ways and many ways implemented in the Julia um, scientific machine learning ecosystem. Um, further, because we need, um, we need at some point the gradient of the solution, um, this, um, which is um, computed by, um, by, um, by, <laughs> by um, which is computed by differentiating through the ODE solver, through the ANN, and um, from step to step. So we have a very, very, very long um, derivative chain at the end, and as you can um, imagine, this is quite expensive um, to do with an automatic differentiation framework. So is it worth it? Um, on training data, we see that we are already far better than the plain artificial neural network. And by the way, I used the same artificial neural network topology as I used for the, um, for the plain ANN approach. So um, it's the same size and the same amount of training steps. Um, sure, it's still not perfect. Um, there are some little deviations. But um, as for the plain neural network, um, we could do it better by using a larger topology and train it for longer. So um, the great advantage um, comes on the next slide. On testing data, um, we are far better than the plain ANN. Um, at least the neural ODE um, has understood something of the physical process. Um, the extrapolation after 600, uh, 600 seconds is um, not, still not as good as for the physical model. But um, one can see that something is correctly understood here. So the direction and the trends of the trajectory are doing quite well. Let's conclude. Um, so neural ODEs um, do work on testing and on training. Um, we could do better if we want, um, of course. And we have some new cool features like um, dynamic time stepping during solving of the neural ODE and also dynamic um, step size control. Um, further, we can even change the solver if we want to. And for example, we could train the neural ODE on a specific solver um, for stiff differential equations if we know um, that we are training for a very stiff system. So what if um, we combine the advantages of both worlds. So the explainability, um, the physical correctness, and the good extrapolation capability of the physical modeling world, and the ability of the data-driven approach. Yeah. Um, I think that would be indeed a good explanation because as soon as, we, uh, as long as we are driving relatively um, small velocities, um, the quadratic part um, 
will not um, affect the system very much. And I think that's in, indeed a very good ex explanation. Even, even if I didn't think about it um, when, genera when generating this plot. Uh, but that's, um, I think that's a great explanation. Yes. So, um, exactly. So we want uh, to use the great explainability, the physical correctness, and the good extrapolation from the physical modeling world and the ability to, um, to fill these little gaps in, um, between our simulation model and, the, um, and data um, from the data-driven modeling world. Um, when we did our first steps with neural ODs, um, we found that training real and often discontinuous systems um, is really hard as soon as we are using plain neural ODEs. Um, but we had much, 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 much better results. As soon as we combined the neural ODE with some basic physics, um, even if it was just a little bit. Um, so for us, one of, the uh, one of the steps necessary to bring neural ODEs in real life applications is to pair them with some, basics, uh, some basic physics. But how can we do that? Um, well, in our drawing, um, we can just glue the ODE and the neural ODE, so the ANN and the ODE solver um, together, because why not? Um, so we have our ODE, um, some interconnecting signals here um, that could be state derivatives or state or any other signal that is, com um, or any other signal that is computed by the ODE system, and um, finally the solver. So there are different names for that topology, um, like hybrid neural ODE, or it's a subtype of universal differential equation, um, but we just call it straightforward um, physics enhanced neural ODE. Um, or in short, the P node. Um, so the big question at this point is, um, just because we could um, doesn't mean we should, does this really make anything better? And you bet it does. Um, I have a little anal uh, analogy. Um, on the left, we have a plain neural ODE. So a plain neural ODE is like an empty canvas. Um, so an empty canvas can basically form into any dynamic systems because I can draw anything on it. Um, so we can it to describe uh, the, the dynamics of um, a train, for example. But we can also train it uh, for something completely different like um, spreading dynamics of disease like COVID. So a neural ODE with some physical equations in it, um, we call this a physics enhanced neural ODE, um, is like a canvas with a car sketch on it. So um, it can be trained into a sporty convertible um, or even a monster truck. Um, but training COVID spreading dynamics, um, no way. So this looks um, somehow like a restriction, um, but as always, this comes with a big advantage. Um, drawing a train from the scratch is not easy, at least not for me. So drawing a convertible on basis of a car sketch seems quite doable. The same applies to neural ODEs and physics enhanced neural ODEs. So training is much more intense if we do it with an empty canvas. Um, that becomes much more easy and faster when we start with a sketch of our dynamic system. So the first real sticky note for today is um, injection of knowledge, um, for example, in form of an ODE into neural ODEs enhances training. We have faster convergence. Um, we have a reduced A and N size because A and N needs only be to be large enough to learn the unmodeled physical effect. Uh, and therefore, less local minima, and uh, we also need much, much, much less data. Um, if the, the question was if the... No mm -hmm. Yes, um, we use... We, the, the core of the hybrid modeling neural FMU is the 
same um, model we showed previously as um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, that's a great point. We had a lot of discussions um, about this. Um, it depends basically from which side you originally came from. Um, and because um, we started with neural ODs, we called it physics enhanced neural ODs, but you're 100% um, right. Um, it depends basically on um, which, uh, how much do you take from which world and um, I have no, have, have no good um, answer to this question, and uh, yeah. <laughs> exactly, yeah. But this is not, um, it, de it depends. It, um, if you're doing wrong assumptions, uh, that, uh, that could be something negative. If you're doing the right assumptions, um, you, get faster training, um, exactly. <laughs> yeah, that, this is a point um, we can, can talk very long uh, about. <laughs> but the most, the, the, the most easy initialization method would indeed to initialize it um, as identity, but this had, has many, many disadvantages too. So, um, but we come to this later, I think. Yeah. Yes, sir? Mm -hmm. um, it could take um, the state derivative, the state, or any other observable uh, variable of the OD system. So basically, the state um, captures the entire information, but um, it could um, be efficient to, um, to take a state-dependent variable here, too. It's <laughs> okay now. You know, you you do model evaluations for mm -hmm. so the
Even if the train, even if the train's no um, I would suggest that um, I would be happy if we could discuss this further uh, after after the presentations of. Mm -hmm. um, But yeah. Um. So, um, the, um, well, what did I want to say at this point? Um, exactly. Um, we are, in most applications we are doing um, with this approach, um, we are only needing uh, um, one single measurement trajectory. So, um, we, this is, this is considered a r ridiculous little amount of data in machine learning applications. Um, it basically depends on how large is the physical effect that was not modeled in the system. So back to the um, physics enhanced neural ODE. Um, we are making some assumptions because um, we don't see any evidence um, for now. Um, we assume that um, physics enhanced neural ODEs combine some advantages of physical and data driven modeling world and they even may outperform plain neural ODEs under similar training conditions. So the only thing is, um, as always, um, reality is a bit more complicated um, than a picture of this nice topology. Um, how to get from this drawing to a um, working neural ODE is the core topic um, for the workshop. Today, um, the most obvious point is um, real engineering models are huge. Um, they count hundreds or thousands of equations and they are designed um, not by manipulation uh, um, systems of equations by hand, but in a dedicated modeling tool. So even if we want, we could not export these models as ODEs and import them into Julia. So, um, because there is simply no, no function um, for ODE export, these tools um, don't have an ODE export functionality. And even if they had translating such models um, would be a real pain. So, um, we need a trick to make um, these models from modeling tools um, somehow easy to handle. 
And luckily, there's a way. Um, it's called the functional mockup interface. It's a standardized interface for model exchange, co-simulation, scheduled execution of simulation models. And it's platform independent. And um, standardized models are called functional mockup units or FMUs. Um, so let's have a quick look on a generic ODE system. Um, in fact, it's a little bit more complicated than in the diagram on the slide before. We have different inputs, the state X, some system inputs U, the time T parameters, and on the output side, we have the system state derivative and some additional outputs um, or observable variables we might be interested in. So if we further look at the interface of a model exchange FMU, we notice that, uh, well, it's basically the same. So um, all inputs are the same. And this is not a little happy coincidence, but the guys behind FMI um, designed the interface with exactly that goal. So the only difference is um, that most FMUs don't show the system of equations. Um, so they only allow to evaluate the system, but we cannot um, see what is inside. Um, the idea is that that complicates um, reverse engineering of simulation models if they are shared among different companies. So for us, this hiding of equations um, complicates differentiation over FMUs, but we already have some good solutions for that. Um, in case, just in case if, if you never heard of FMI, um, it's not just a standard for model exchange. Um, in the engineering world, it's basically the standard. Um, it's implemented in over 170 modeling and simulation tools. And the method of choice um, for sharing um, models um, by different, um, different well-known companies from automotive, aerospace engineering, and beyond. So um, equipped with FMUs. Um, ah, uh, sorry. Um, we, we have a dedicated library um, to import FMUs into Julia. It's called fmi.pl. Um, FMUs are um, in the, the standard mode is that they are compiled binaries, but some um, may only uh, also include um, source code. Um, so it basically depends on how you want it to be exported. Mm -hmm. If I get an FMU, if the question is if I uh, have a guarantee that I could run a FMU if I get it, yes. And um, it's uh, basically, on Windows it's a uh, compiled um, dynamic linker library with a standardized interface. So um, you know that there are um, function, uh, function heads. That is basically what the FMI, the functional mockup interface, standardize. Um, and does this answer the question? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Oh, they're, they're really useful. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, Mm -hmm. It comes down to, to a C implementation, but to be honest, almost um, everyone is not sharing the C code, but only the compiled binary because of... Um, yeah. <laughs> mm. They, yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. 
you're speaking about a really big problem there because um, most implementations, it's, it's called um, FMI get directional derivatives. There's a function for that. Um, but most tools impl uh, implement only finite differences. So, the, so they are basically sampling their own ODE system even if they know it um, on symbolic level. So they are using finite difference because it's super easy to implement and this is a real issue. Um, Yeah. <clears throat> um, so, um, where did I stop? Um, yes, now we have the FMU of our system and um, this entire thing becomes much, much, much more easy and because we know we could um, substitute our ODE just with a model exchange FMU because it's the same interface. Um, we call this resulting structure neural FMU, but you know it's basically the same as a physics enhanced neural ODE, but with an industrial modeling standard um, in it. So um, even if we are using FMUs in this workshop today, um, everything we show is fully compliant with generic ODE systems. So if you want to use symbolic ODEs in Julia instead of FMUs, um, this is totally possible. Um, everything we do here is not restricted to FMUs. Um, but we are using FMUs here because even the presented system, which is far not the most complicated, um, counts 279 equations. Um, and using ODE systems is therefore not very handy, as you can imagine. Um, the system model is, by the way, from Daimler. Uh, so we just exported the existing simulation model as FMU and that's it. So I hope you're motivated now. Um, the only thing we further need to do um, before some basic coding is a quick look on the used libraries. Um, even if we focus on neural ODEs, um, we have a very short look on the entire workflow. So from modeling job description to a ready to use hybrid model, um, what are the big steps required? Um, we start by doing physical modeling in the application of our choice. Um, if we are done, we export the physical model as FMU and import it <coughs> into Julia um, using um, the library fmi.jl by us. So in Julia, we extend the model to a hybrid model, and um, this is done with the help of FMI Flux, uh, which is also a Julia library by us. And after we finished training, there are multiple ways um, to go back. So first, we can export the entire hybrid model as FMU again, um, and import, um, we, we use FMI export.shell for this, um, and import it back into our modeling tool. Um, second, we can only export the ANN as FMU and um, import this ANN FMU back into the um, original modeling environment and combine it with the first principle model or a physical model um, we already have there. Or third, we export the ANN in a dedicated format like, um, you know, there is ONNX or even Modelica and connect it to our physical um, model in the modeling tool. So for today, we are only focusing on the methodical part here. Um, but I think it's important to know um, the full development cycle of this thing. Um, if you're further interested in this part, um, we contribute um, to the Modelica conference 2023 in Aachen um, in October. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. 
exactly, that's a perfect explanation. <laughs> So from software side, um, we need, first we need something to import FMUs into Julia, and that's fmi.jl. And if we are in Julia, we need um, a library to do machine learning with um, FMUs, and that's fmi flux. And um, further, we have this little package here, it's called the fmi suit. It's basically a collection of, um, of some FMUs we use for testing, for automated testing the other packages. But it is also the container for today's model FMU. So we need the FMI suit today too. Um, by the way, if you find anything of these useful, um, leave us a star at GitHub um, because we are always happy if there are some new. And that's enough said for this slide. Um, let's get started. So, um, we are doing some coding preparations. Um, before we start, I need to say sorry, I did a little faux pas. Because I used a Jupyter notebook instead of a Pluto one. Um, I didn't know that Pluto is already this far, but because I want to have a closer look on Pluto anyway, I promise to do better and translate it um, today's workshop um, to Pluto too. Um, so, um, we start by <coughs> we start by loading in the packages. Um, first thing is um, FMI and FMI flux and the FMI zoo. Um, we further need the default um, machine learning framework in Julia, which is flux. Oh, sure, yeah, sure. Um, Ah, yeah, this works. Is this, is this okay? Okay. <laughs> no problem. Um, we, can we discuss after the workshop? Thanks. Um, so we use Flux and the default machine learning framework in Julia and um, JLD2, JLD2 um, for um, saving and loading arrays or parameters. Hmm? It's uh, as as you wish. Um, there, there's already um, I, I um, pasted the link um, to this notebook. It's on the GitHub repository of FMI Flux, and it's at the um, at the second slide um, where the agenda is. Um, so the presentation slides, by the way, are. Um, linked in the um, slot on the JuliaCon, um, in the JuliaCon. So, um, we use JLD2 and um, the random, random library for fixing the random seed. Um, this is um, just, just um, handy if you are um, doing notebooks because they are doing the same every time you compile them. And we are using plots um, to plot some intermediate results. Um, further, we have a little helper script. Um, you, can, you can have a look inside, but there's nothing special in it. It's basically just um, a few plotting functions to make things um, look nice. There's no functional um, content in it. And um, because these Jupyter notebooks um, are not good at displaying progress bars, um, we disable them here. So, um, as I said, everything of this is online, so um, you can concentrate on a topic or you can code it by yourself as you wish. Ah, the, yeah, the, the, the link might be damaged, but um, you have the correct link um, at the slides. Um, so, um, first thing we want to do after loading in um, the libraries is loading some measurements. And the measurements are um, part of the FMI suit together with the model itself. Um, FMI suit supports um, 
in inter downsampling um, of the data because um, it is it was me measured at around 100 hertz I think and that that's a bit too much for today so we uh, use a different uh, delta time of 0 0.1 seconds. Um, the command VLDM just loads um, VLDM data. Yes? I'm sorry, could you repeat? That's a model exchange, yeah. Uh, th this is only the sampling frequency for the data. It's not a fixed time step for the OD server. So, so no. Also, th this is um, this is really just the sampling frequency of the data we are using. Um, exactly. So um, we call VLDM and um, with the symbol train and uh, the sampling frequency we want our data. And um, the first thing we do. Um, after loading data, of course, we want to plot it. So um, we call um, plot. You might um, be familiar with the plotting interface in Julia, I think. And we put in the time points, the speed was captured, and the actually speed values, and um, a ribbon. Um, keep in mind that we have two measurements, so we don't have a single line. We have an area um, where our measurement um, is in, but um, I need to say that the deviation is very, 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 very little. So as you can see, um, it basically just looks like a straight line here. So um, this is only some plotting sugar, basically, um, label, title, and so on. So and this is, these are, this is the um, first 30% of the WLTC driving cycle as we saw it during the presentation. Um, further, we load some validation data. This is also possible, this time with the keyword validate instead of train to um, capture the validation data set. And we also could plot validation data and we see um, it's the entire WLTC driving cycle. So not just the first 600 seconds, but the entire driving cycle. Um, so, Further, let's, let's extract um, three variables, um, t-start, t-stop, and t-save. t-start is um, the starting point for our simulation, so the time point of the first measurement. Uh, t-stop is the end point for our simulation, so the last recorded um, timestamp. And t-save are the saving time points for our ODE solution. And as you can see here, um, this is uh, the T-safe array. We, ha we have indeed a, um, a de delta time of uh, 0 0.1 seconds as we specified um, during loading of data. So um, next thing we need is a start state. So during solving of ODE, you need to specify starting conditions. And uh, this is also um, something we can capture from the FMI zoo um, using the method get state vector. So it um, returns a state vector for any point in time we are interested in. So um, this time it's, it's only zeros, but um, this is a very special case and not the default one. Um, further, um, there's a little parameter array in the, in the FMI zoo for the FMU because um, before doing um, simulation we can Speci uh, specify some parameters for the um, functional mockup unit. And this parameter array basically contains um, three paths to the char characteristic maps we want to use. The first one is um, the power electronics uh, characteristic map, the electric drive characteristic map, and the last one is the driving cycle characteristic map. Um, loading the FMU is actually very easy. Um, you just call FMI load. Um, you would um, specify a path if you're loading your very own FMU, which is somewhere on your hard drive. But the FMI zoo have, um, has an override 
um, to use um, predefined models such as the VLDM. So you can call FMI load VLDM and this will load the vehicle longitudinal dynamics model instead of some local FMU. Hmm? Ah, so yeah. Just, just need to hit me <laughs> if you ever ask a question. What do you mean by I.O.? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Here is an object called I.O. object. Yeah. 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 This is. Do you know if this supports both the I.O. object on top of the path to the object? And as far as I know, this is not possible for now. Um, if you can specify an I.O. instead of um, a, a file path. Um, I, I, I would I would say not as far as I know, but but no gu no guarantee on that. Okay. So as, as far as I know, the the note of. Yes, and if you're interested in some model metadata, you can call FMI info and it will print um, many interesting things like how much states are in there and how are they called and how many inputs, outputs, and um, some other interesting things like which um, features are supported because the FMI specifies um, some um, features that are optional to implement. So you don't need to implement the entire standard to be able to compile an FMU and there's a minimal subset and some additional optional features. So after loading in the FMU, um, we simulate it and simulation, and simulation is um, as easy as calling FMI simulate. Um, we put in the FMU some starting and stopping point. Um, by the way, no starting state because um, there's an initialization problem solved at the FMU, so we do, don't need to specify an, an starting state necessary, there's a default one. And um, the parameters from the FMI zoo, um, if we show or don't want to show a progress bar, and um, there's the field record values where we can specify values that we want to record during simulation. Um, we could give an array, but there's also support for wildcards like derivatives. So if you just put in derivatives, it um, captures every state derivative in the system. And we want it to be saved at tsave. So um, our um, time points, we want the ODE solution to be saved. Um, after simulation, we can have a look on the results. Um, so we see the number of um, F, FX um, evaluations. Um, we have sensitivity information, but there's, there's only zeros because we did a simulation without any ID behind it. And um, can also have a look on some um, event handling statistics. So far more interesting is of course uh, to plot this thing. Um, we can use um, the default plotting library for this, we put in the simulation result and can specify some um, additional keywords like we don't want the derivatives, so the values we define to be recorded to be plotted, so we say values is false. Um, we can define some state indices, um, so a range from six to six equals six. We want only the state six to be plotted and it's, that's a cumulative consumption of our model and um, this is, again, only a label. So, um, as you can see, this is um, the plot um, that we already know from um, the presentation slides. Sorry? 
um, state event. Um, state event. There are two types of event um, of events in FMI. Um, there are state events and time events. Time events are a little bo a little bit more um, more easy to explain because they're predefined time instances at which um, a discontinuity happens. Uh, it's a um, yeah. It's a um, basically it's um, a state dependent event. So if a state um, there are event event indicators which are state dependent, and if an event indicator um, is doing a zero crossing, um, you know that a state event was triggered, and you can use the Julia um, DFQ callbacks to identify the exact um, event location and handle it properly. So these um, these blue lines are state events, and as you can see, there are many many events. So the system is very discontinu uh, dis uh, this heavily discon it's a discontinuous system. So, um, time events are disabled um, during this plot because we have um, 100 time events per second. So any time we are taking a new sample from the WLTC driving cycle, we need to, do, um, we need to handle our time events. Um, so these are not plotted here because it would just be a red area. <clears throat> So um, let's um, continue. Um, now the challenges. Um, we have many, many challenges um, on our journey to design a neural ODE. There will be some pitfalls and. Um, some of them are neural FMU specific. Some of them um, will also apply to plain neural ODEs. So even to neural ODEs that um, have no um, no ODE at all um, or FMU inside of them. So the first thing we have a closer look on is um, a physics enhanced neural ODE specific topic, and it's um, on how to design a suitable topology. Um, the question is, um, how should we glue the FMU, um, the ODE, and uh, the FMU or ODE, the ANN, and the numerical solver together? Um, when we did our first um, try building a neural FMU a few slides ago, um, we did choose such a sequential topology. So um, let's recall the signal flow quick. Um, we have a state. Um, given to the model exchange FMU or the ODE. Um, this produces some state derivatives or some state outputs or any other outputs that are passed to the artificial neural ne network and the neural network is able to somehow correct um, the modeling um, of the FMU or the ODE before it is integrated into the next system state. Um, for now, this topology is um, referenced as sequential um, topology, and as usual, if there's some, uh, something sequential, we also have a parallel option. Um, uh, just let's, let, let's recall this in quick. Um, we manipulate or correct signals from the FMU or the ODE. Um, we can doing applications that need to correct modeling errors this way, and this is a parallel Option. So instead of feeding the signal from um, one block to the next, um, both blocks, so the FMU or the ODE and the artificial neural network um, are computing system dynamics in parallel. So um, these signals must, of course, be merged somehow. Um, there are different ways of um, adding them together, um, uh, dif different ways of combining them, like, for example, adding them together. Um, or we do a separation like the FMU computes free state derivatives and the artificial neural network computes three other state derivatives um, in a six state system, for example. So in this case, um, the ANN computes its very own dynamics. And um, this is interesting if you want to train for an unmodeled effect. So think about a system where friction, a uh, system where friction or something similar was neglected during modeling. Um, so far so good, um, but what 
is if I just don't know what is the missing effect. Um, so I'm not sure about um, what, if it's a modeling error or um, it needs to be corrected um, sequential or it's um, a special effect I need to train for and it needs to be corrected in a parallel topology. So if I can decide um, by myself, um, it's often easier to let decide and um, we want someone um, who is making good decisions at this point and this is um, the optimizer for our neural ODE parameters. Um, so if I want to outsource the decision, um, should I model it sequential or parallel, um, we basically only need to enable the topology being able to express both cases. Um, so if I'm doing so, I can just fade between them on basis on trainable parameters. Um, this is done by, uh, by introducing two gates. Um, so one controls how much from the FMU dynamics um, contribute to the resulting system dynamics and the other one how much of the ANN dynamics are used. And this is far more easy to understand um, if I play around with it and check out um, some edge cases. So for a fully open FMU gate and a fully closed ANN gate, we are basically doing a plain FMU simulation um, because the derivatives by the FMU are directly passed to the numerical solver and the ANN simply just can influence anything on the system because the gate is closed. So in this configuration, um, the physics enhanced neural ODE solution um, equals the FMU solution or the ODE solution if you're using an ODE here instead. For a fully open ANN gate and a fully closed FMU gate, um, we ignore the FMU dynamics completely and we take only the corrected derivatives from the ANN here. So um, we have the sequential topology, sequential topology in this case. <clears throat> and finally, if both gates are open, um, we use the FMU dynamics side by side with the ANN dynamics and this is basically the parallel topology. So these were some edge cases. Um, of course, one can continuously fade between and beyond them. Um, we observe that with this topology, um, we can train the sequential and the parallel um, case. As already stated, um, one um, one could just train the gate parameters and together with the ANN parameters, or you can control the gate parameters like um, fading from a fully open FMU gate in a fully open ANN gate. And, yeah. Yeah, you can add additional states. Um, you can, but you don't need to. That's, it's up to you, basically. Um, and as a little extra, um, you don't need no additional initialization. That was the point with the identity. Um, you don't need any additional initialization. Um, you need to keep in mind um, that we don't know anything about the system dynamics if we do a random initialization of our ANN parameters. Um, the considered system, the resulting system could be um, super stiff or even instable, and, um, but we will focus on this specific point later. Um, so this best practice here is, um, if you don't know the missing physical effects, um, you don't know how they interact with the system, um, you can just use gates and uh, let you, your optimizer decide. Um, it's different. Um, the, the correct answer would be it's part of hyperparameter optimization, the initial configuration. Um, often we start with a fully open FMU gate and a fully closed ANN gate. So um, we can slowly um, train the ANN in the right direction um, before um, it uh, could how somehow destabilize the system or similar. <coughs> Mm 
Yeah. Um, so the question is direction of the um, of the actually use I and M dimension. Um, as, as always in machine learning, this is also part of uh, a hyperparameter optimization, I would think. So, yeah, they're, they're, they're quite small, they're quite small. Um, I think we have about um, 250 parameters in, in the system for today which is a super, super small artificial neural network. Um, Mm -hmm. At the very end, yeah. So, um, so the best practice was um, to use gates if you are unsure about um, your topology. And there is, of course, a very, very, very little disadvantage because we have more parameters in um, this case, but um, one need to say that the number of um, parameters in the ANN is much, much, much more greater than a few gate parameters here. So this doesn't actually really count. Um, now we had, um, now that we have the overall topology um, structure, we need to talk about the structure um, in more detail and because what signals from the FNU should be connected to the ANN. So this part here. Um, what are these three dots? Um, to input time itself in the um, artificial neural network is not a good idea um, because in this case we don't want to learn an explicit time dependent effect and we want to learn some physical effect. Um, our system has no external inputs so um, we don't need them here either. If we have a closer look on the FNU itself, um, as already stated, we find out that it has um, around 550 observable variables. Um, so to be on the very safe side, um, we should connect all of these 550 signals um, to the ANN. But this would be a huge um, performance leak because in this case sensitivity for every connected signal need to be determined. And that's quite, a, quite slow as you can imagine. So from system theory lecture, um, we know that all system, all system observables, um, all outputs, all variables um, can be computed on basis of a minimal subset of variables and this is called the system state. So basically the system state captures all the information needed. And the good luck for us is um, that we have only six states in the systems, in the system. So um, this is much, much less um, than the 550 observables. Um, further, um, if we don't want to compute dynamics by ourselves, but use the existing dynamics from the FNU, um, we could add the six state derivatives also, so this makes 12 inputs to the ANN and um, we can even reduce this set um, with expert knowledge and because we don't want to enhance our driver model, um, we can um, remove the driver um, related states and derivatives, um, the PI controller integrated errors and the driving cycle target position are states that we don't want to influence with our um, neural network. So, uh, we don't want our neural network to learn from. So uh, we can remove them. Um, we assume that the effect should not depend on the absolute vehicle position. Um, that could indeed be if we are driving like up an hill, but um, we have a dy dynamometer testing bench, so this, the effect should not be absolute position dependent. So we remove the vehicle position. Um, 
we assume that um, the effect further does not depend on the cumulative consumption of the vehicle. This could, however, be if there would be some um, state of charge dependency in the battery, um, but um, we remove it. And the vehicle velocity, as you can see, is now redundant. So we have it as state and as derivative. This is because we have a second order OD system. And um, of course, we, don't, uh, we, we only need one of them. So um, we remove the vehicle velocity state. And it remains um, three state derivatives, the vehicle velocity, acceleration, and the vehicle consumption. So you can consider that as the modeling engineer's part in hybrid modeling. Um, so doing some clever decisions that improves your training performance. Um, selecting a clever subset of A and N input variables reduces training effort drastically. So um, these are the inputs for our artificial neural network. Um, what should the A and N change? So what are the outputs of the A and N? Yeah. For now, it's expert knowledge, but um, we are um, researching in a direction that um, this could be further, um, at least semi-automatic. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, basically you can. Um, the, 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 most easy, the most easy procedure would be um, we do a first, um, a first training and connect everything. And after the model is trained, uh, we can do sensitivity anal analysis and see, oh, all these inputs doesn't um, actually affect the, the system. And we can, can remove them and do a new training with an optimal subset of, um, of inputs. Um, you can do this online, but it's, um, it's a topic of research, a current topic of research. So um, the ANN outputs. Um, in this case, we only have the six state derivatives because we cannot manipulate the state. And the system state is basically read-only. Um, so um, it's determined by numerical integration. We cannot affect the system state directly here. Um, we can remove the driver derivatives again um, because of the same reason. and. Um, we further remove the velocity again. In this case, it's not because of redundancy. Um, there, there's no second vehicle velocity. But um, as already stated, we have a second order ODE system. Um, so we have a position that is differentiated into velocity, which is differentiated in acceleration. So as soon as we would allow the vehicle velocity and the acceleration to be an A and N outputs, we would have um, simply no guarantee that the acceleration is still derivative of velocity. So from a mathematical point of view, we would disintegrate our second order ODE in a first order ODE system, and this is not good. So the best practice and the reason why we remove the velocity here is um, don't break the physical order of differentiation of your, of your ODE system. Um, so now we have ANN inputs and outputs. Um, so we can have a look on our current topology. 
um, we can conclude that um, the ANN learns on basis of vehicle velocity, acceleration, and consumption, and it manipulates, so the output side of the ANN, only the vehicle acceleration and consumption because we don't want to break our physical differentiation order. Um, we are really close to a ready to implement concept now. There's only one little thing left. There are problems when breaking the physical um, uh, it's a question of what what is the problem if you disintegrate the ODE system order? I'm sorry, I, I don't understand the question. Could, could you speak a little bit louder? If we apply this architecture to physical systems, yeah, a lot of. Um, so we, we have the use case for today. We have, um, I, I give you um, some, some uh, multiple examples um, at the very end, but we are using this in completely different domains. Um, this is vehicle simulation, but we're using it um, also for biological simulations, so in simulations of the human cardiovascular system. Um, we're using it for closed loop EC control motor simulations. And it's always a very similar, um, there, there are some differences, but um, the core is very similar to this. Um, at the Modelica conference in Aachen, we're presenting a use case um, with an hydraulic excavator arm, um, which um, we learned a friction model for. So um, there, there are many, many different um, use, play, uh, use cases for the tool. I hope. <laughs> prove me, prove me. <laughs> yeah, ba basically, I, I would I would not restrict um, any any physical system by default. Um, so there there there's there's just no reason um, to to say that it, it couldn't work for any specific use case. So um, until now, we are very, very specific. We are only considering ODEs. We are not considering any special physical um, assumptions that we can um, apply this method. So um, the last little thing we need to do is um, a thing that is done very intuitively um, in other machine learning applications, and it's data pre and post processing. Um, so um, ANNs, or better their activation functions, have value ranges where they can oper uh, operate very efficiently. Um, so before training, data is converted in this operation range, um, that is the pre-processing part. And after the ANN inference, um, the outputs of the ANN are um, transformed back into a human understandable uh, value range, and that's the post-processing um, part. Um, so think about a neuron with a hyperbolic tangent activation function. Um, the layer output is always between minus one and one, because that's the only um, output a hyperbolic tangent can generate. Um, but a FMU that may become after the ANN might expect um, larger values. Um, or think about um, a FMU that generates very large values, and these values get drastically saturated by the uh, tangent, uh, hyperbolic tangent function. Um, so the difference in this case is um, that we need to do these uh, pre- and post-processing operations not offline before we start to train, and we need to do it online, so as part of the topology every time we are um, changing the domain. So every time we are going from ANN to ODE or to, to ANN back. Um, so I have a little 
example for this. Um, in our system, we have um, very large values um, by the FMU. So the cumulative consumption is as big as um, 10 to the um, 10 to the order to the power of eight. Um, the velocity here um, is much, much, much smaller. But even if you put um, this velocity profile into an artificial neural network, um, you have only this line here at the output because, um, as already stated, um, the hyperbolic tangent saturates it. Hmm? Um, Yeah, in, in, yes, but, but even um, these activation functions, um, I think, have operation ranges where they are very strong. Or, yeah. Yeah, it's like, yeah, it's but, 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 yeah. Yeah, well, but, but this could, um, could be an option. A linear activation function. Um, so you mean like a, a real loop? Yeah, maybe we want to learn some nonlinearity for the system. By, by many, 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 many real loops. Um, the, the, that would indeed be an option. But even if you are using the real loop, you try to keep your operation range close to zero, because if you go far to, to um, far 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 to the left um, in the ReLU function, your gradient um, dies because you can't see any changes. Um, th there are many reasons to keep um, keep the operation point close to close to an optimum. Um, so very very large um, values in artificial neural networks. And very, very small values are, are always bad, um, almost independently of the activation function. So I think there, maybe you, you could um, skip this by choosing an appropriate um, activation function, um, but, I, um, but the generic approach um, is this um, to keep it. Mm -hmm. Um, it, you, 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 yeah, you, you could, you could use uh, unlimited activation function for the um, for the output layer. This is true, but this would not solve the problem at the very input layer. So, if the FMU um, generates values as large as ten to the power of eight, um, we have no ability. Um, did this um, value would drastically be saturated, and this is nothing you could um, you could solve by choosing a specific activation function. No? No? Ah, okay, I, I understand, but um, you will at least you will need um, much, much, much training because you need to pull your weights. Um, um, you, you need to pull down your weights, basically, um, to, to very, very, very small values um, to be able to be in the, um, in the right operation range. Um, hmm? No? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Okay, I see there are um, many, many new um, things popping up. Um, for, no, for, no, for now, the thing we are, so the, the way we are doing it for now is we just had a linear transformation um, before and after the artificial neural network. So um, we add basically something like a shifting and scaling operation 
um, before and after the ANN. Um, we have different operation modes. Um, the FMI flux default is to shift and scale values so that we have a data mean of zero and a standard deviation of one if we're using the um, hyperbolic tangent actuation function here. But um, there will be many new things in future, I think. So um, we can train these parameters, of course, together with the ANN parameters because um, doing a mean of zero and the standard deviation of one is only valid for pre-recorded data and we um, the system dynamics can change during the training process so we need to adapt to new ranges during training. So usually we train these pre and pro post-processing pi um, parameters together with the ANN parameters. So um, the best practice at this um, slide is that online signal transformation at domain boundaries, so domain boundaries in the context of you, we, switch, we are switching from ANN machine learning to FMU and back um, is necessary. So um, the only thing I added here are the pre and post processing layers um, before and after the ANN. Now let's uh, see how we can implement that. And Julia, um, how can we translate such a struct in a flux machine learning chain? Um, the red dot in the topology here is um, the you are here dot. Um, so the FMU is implemented as callable struct. So one could just call um, the loaded FMU um, as the first layer we put in the system state and the FMU returns a state derivative x dot. Um, we use a caching layer. I will introduce them a little bit more in detail as soon as we are coding. Um, we use a cache layer which does nothing but cache the values so it behaves, uh, it, it, it just feed throughs um, the derivatives but it copies them. So we are caching um, the output from the FMU, so the state derivatives by the FMU. Um, we reduce our um, vector dx um, to hold only the elements four, five, and six. These are um, the vehicle velocity, vehicle acceleration, and vehicle consumption that we want to further um, push into the A and N. Um, we have our pre-processing layer, which does this linear transformation. And the final artificial neural network, which um, you can see is very, very, very small. It's only um, um, a dense layer with three inputs and uh, 32 outputs. And the same back, but in this case only with two outputs because we only want to manipulate acceleration and consumption, not the velocity because of the um, order of the ODE. So um, the acceleration and consumption output is post-processed and um, now the cache retrieve layer comes and it retrieves things we pushed in the cache previously. The syntax is um, cache retrieve five to six means um, take elements five and six from the cache. This, these are the um, consumption and acceleration by the FMU and concatenated um, with the DX from the ANN, so the consumption and acceleration from the artificial neural network. Um, these two things can be pushed in the gates layer, um, which combines the acceleration from FMU and the acceleration from ANN and the, um, the consumption from the FMU and consumption from the ANN. And the results um, are pushed to the last layer, um, which is a cache, cache retrieve elements one to four, uh, one to four, meaning um, we are taking the derivatives one to four, we don't want to manipulate from the FMU and uh, concatenate them with um, the DX we get from the gate. So our computed um, acceleration and computed consumption. So 
Um, all these layers are um, pre-implemented in SNI Flux, so you don't need to code them by yourself or similar. So now that we have a plan, bless you, um, time has come to do some coding again. And yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So we, yeah, um, we are manipulating the system dynamics at the most differentiated level. So um, we can manipulate the acceleration to um, perform a correction on velocity level and even to perform corrections on position level. So, um, this is, yeah. yeah. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. So, um, oh, we have, uh, oh yeah, I had my um, Wi-Fi wi off. Um, so there, there, there's a nice build of the topology, a uh, nice image of the topology, but you know it from the last slide. Um, so um, we start by doing um, pre and post processing and as stated, um, we start by um, initializing, um, by, by checking um, out what um, happens if we just put it in without any pre and post processing. So um, first we capture um, the um, derivatives four, five, and six, and these are the identifiers as specified in the FMU's model description, so it's a dedicated file that um, that holds um, model, additional model information. So, and um, these are the names of the these are the names of the um, three state derivatives um, we want to input in our neural network, and we can retrieve their values from the solution because we recorded them um, with the keyword uh, record values derivatives. Um, we can retrieve them by calling fmi get solution value and um, specifying the variables we want the values from. So um, if we plot the first of these values, which is the velocity, um, we saw this plot um, a few times today, but um, it's the velocity as we, um, as we think it to be. So um, what happens if we um, push this velocity in the hyperbolic tangent function and um, we already saw it a few slides ago, it gets drastically saturated. So we cannot um, become greater than one. And we, we are also losing much information like um, these little friends and so on. They're all um, lost in the saturation, basically. So um, we try this, these shift layers and um, as stated, you can just push your data in the shift layer and it um, computes uh, transformation that leads to a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. 
and if we um, check out the results on the te uh, hyperbolic tangent function for pre-processed um, velocities, we get the following um, image. And of course, the values are um, relative small because we have still the limitation of being um, between minus one and one. But um, we didn't lose the information um, by the saturation. And so every peak that is um, here in data, um, you, you find um, in the pre-processed velocity um, curve. So um, sometimes we add a, another little buffer and this allows um, for preserve even peaks. Um, so think about a fader that is um, in a in a relative, um, in, a, in a constant ribbon, and there are only some very little peaks outside of this ribbon, and they get still saturated, so you can um, manually decrease the scaling at this point, but this is not a really necessary um, point, it's just an optimization. And the post-processing layer is initialized just by um, giving it the pre-processing layer, and so it computes the reverse transformation of the linear transform um, before the NN. The keyword indices um, says um, we only want um, the values two and three, so acceleration and consumption, to be, um, to be a linear, uh, inverse linear transformation to be computed because we, these are our only two outputs for the ANN. So um, we are building the neural FMU model and um, we put it in a dedicated function so we can reuse it. Um, the built neural FMU function just takes um, an FMU and the first line we already know from the lines above. So um, from here on it become, uh, there comes something new. Um, first thing is the cache layer so it's just, um, allocated by calling it, um, and the cache retrieve layer, which is initialized by just pushing a cache layer in. So now they are linked, and cache and cache retrieve layer are linked together. Um, because we um, use a very simple type of gate, and we just want um, the acceleration from FMU and ANN to be summed up, and we want the same for the consumption, to just get summed up, we use the scale sum layer. Um, which um, scales by gate values and sums up. Um, we have four inputs here, um, the acceleration from FMU, the consumption from FMU, acceleration from ANN and consumption from ANN. And to, be, to have the gates fully open um, for the FMU and fully closed for the ANN, we initialize them with 1100. So acceleration from FMU is one, consumption from FMU is one, acceleration from ANN is zero, and consumption from ANN is zero. And um, the second argument is an array that specify which signals are linked. So we're linking signals one and three, so the acceleration from FMU to acceleration from ANN, and the signals two and four, so the consumption from FMU and consumption from ANN. So, um, the, the flux chain, um, we already know this um, from the slides and we can um, recall it very quick. So um, we have the FMU here and we, it's a callable struct. We can just uh, push a state in and uh, use it as a neural network layer. Um, the state derivatives from FMU are cached. We are reducing the state derivative vector to um, only elements four, five, and six to push them into the ANN, we do pre-processing the ANN itself, post-processing cache retrieve um, on elements five and six, meaning we are um, getting the consumption and acceleration from FMU and combine it with a consumption and acceleration from ANN, push them into the gates array and combine the derivatives one, two, three, and four from the FMU, which are not modified at all um, with the modified acceleration and consumption from the ANN. Um, the constructor for a neural FMU is actually pretty easy, so we 
put in the FMU we are using inside the neural FMU. We're putting in our model. It's um, just a regu regular flux uh, chain model and um, specify starting and stopping time where we want our integration to start and to stop. Um, and the keyboard safe that uh, you might know from solving all these solutions just to specify um, points and uh, points in time where we want our ODE solution to be safe. Um, this one is a little um, optimization. We can say the neural FMU states are the same as the FMU states, which is the case here. In general, um, we did on, we also did applications where there is an artificial neural network before the ANN, and uh, this complicates some things that are pre-implemented in FMI flux. If we don't use um, neural networks before the FMU, um, we can set this flag to false and this will um, increase our training performance. So, yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Um, for, for, also for now, for now we are um, only supporting flux um, because um, unfortunately we had no time to, to do the FMI lux for now. Um, but uh, yeah. So yeah, well, this, this will be something for the future. Mm -hmm. A convenient. Um, yes, yeah, so there, there, there are many, many, there are many, many, many libraries working together. I'm sure we have a Flux uh, for machine learning. Um, we have lots of CIML sensitivity in it. Um, we have um, DPQ callbacks for callback handling during uh, training. And um, yeah, and it's basically, a, um, a, it comes all together from the, from the Julia scientific machine learning ecosystem. So. Mm -hmm. there, it's pretty small, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, that, that's a point I don't have any experience in. So um, how difficult it is to port an, a flux specific implementation to a lux specific. Um, but, um, but it sounded as if it wouldn't be that hard, or, or is it? like an abstract interface. Mm-hmm. 
तो If you're interested in, we are um, also using the explicit parameters um, in flux because mm -hmm. So um, let's check out what um, our neural SMU is doing. Um, we call our build neural SMU function and we can simulate the neural SMU just um, as any other ODE in Julia or as the SMU we see we saw before. Um, we are giving the neural SMU a start state x0 uh, starting and stopping time, um, the parameters for the SMU, so not the training parameters, these are the parameters for the SMU, so the three uh, location still characteristic maps. And to show progress, um, we want to show the progress bar or not. And this is simulating. quite long. Ah, yeah, so finally. <laughs> um, so we see our result. Um, the simulation result is um, pretty similar to the one from the SMU, and this is because we initialized it with the open SMU gate and the closed chain N gate, so the results are basically the same as the SMU, and we can also plot them to see that they are identically. And um, this is the data in green and the SMU and neural SMU curves um, overlap each other. Um, so an untrained neural SMU is quite of boring um, because that was much, 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 much overhead to get the same simulation results as the original model. Um, so we do some training with it. And for this, um, we define some training data, a train T, other time points we want to train on that is identically to the, um, to the time points we got in our data measurement. And the training data is um, the, cum the cumulative consumption values we got from our um, FMI zoo data object. So we, need just to need con uh, we, we just need to convert this into an array of arrays um, because by design we can have multiple uh, multi-dimensional data for training too. So um, at this point we just um, switch back to our presentation slides um, to make some additional methodical thinking. Um, so, uh, sorry? Sure, in this one. Uh, yes. Um, the FMU does not have any parameters, but um, just because you ask, um, you can train the physical parameters um, too. So we have support for this. You can specify um, basically think about the car mass. If there's an uncertainty regarding the car mass, you can specify it here too. And this parameter gets trained together with the NN parameter. So you can do parameter optimization of your physical model side by side with training hybrid models. Yeah, it's, 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 li it's like a parameter fitting um, from the model. But um, yeah, it's, it's nice because it's integrated in the entire training process. Um, 
the cache layer has no trainable parameters, and this, of course, um, also not um, pre-processing and post-processing have uh, each uh, parameter set, and cache retrieve no gates and the gate parameters, and that's it. <coughs> mm -hmm. um, does I go to, um, the, the last time I checked out I go to, um, in more detail uh, there was still no support for in place function evaluations um, of F1X yeah. so mutating errors is not allowed and, and things like that the problem is that we are doing um, very high amount of evaluations um, of the ODE system and if we need to allocate a new um, vector for, for every return value um, you need to keep in mind that there are often ODE systems with 100 states or something like that if you do a million evaluations with a hundred states and need to allocate the stuff so even Zygote so becomes slow we are using um, there's support for Zygote you can use Zygote um, but we are working mostly with forward diff and reverse diff. Um, forward diff because it's um, still the most robust option um, that um, we, especially if it comes to event handling and discontinuous systems and so on. And if it is supported and not every ODE system can, can be solved this way, but if it's supported, we use reverse diff because it's much more performant than, um, than forward diff. So these are the three options that are natively integrated in FMI Flux, I go to forward diff and reverse diff. Um, so um, some things before we can train that thing. Um, let's speak about batching. Um, we have too much data to train um, to, to, to train on the entire trajectory, so we need to separate it into little pieces. In blue, um, we have a measurement of, of a fictional system. And this system is discontinuous, so we got these two um, event locations, and at event locations, we have jumps in our state trajectory. Um, but um, that's, that's not that important at this point. Um, in theory, batching is very straightforward. So um, we cut our measurement data into equally sized batch elements. So we have batch element one, batch element two, and batch element three. Um, when we are simulating our batch element one, um, so blue dashed is our simulation result, blue solid is where we want to be, um, we have a little deviation because we are not perfect um, for this. Maybe we're becoming better, but, but at this point we are not perfect. Um, for the next batch element, we do not start by this wrong solution. We reset our solution and start simulating with the correct start state. Um, so we have a deviation here again. And um, the same applies to the last batch element, of course. So um, where's, the, where's the problem here? Um, when we are finished with training, um, there are no batch elements anymore. And therefore, um, there is no uh, resetting to the right solution between the batch elements. And um, so if we simulate this all at once, um, the, and the errors are always in the same direction, um, the, the error accumulates um, over the simulation. And um, this can be really problematic um, because um, the more we diverge from the solution we want to be from our measurements, um, the less we know about the system and uh, this is problematic because we don't know if the system is still valid at these points. Um, could you give an example for this?
Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Exactly, exactly, yeah. Yeah, absolutely correct. Absolutely correct, yeah. Yeah, absolutely correct. Yeah. Um, and this is, um, of course, a bad thing, um, because because that that that's the that's the end of the story. Um, so what can we do against this? Um, it's almost more important to have a continuous solution, and so continuous between the batching borders, um, instead of having a good fit on each batch element that might diverge um, if I remove my batching system. So a very easy solution to this is um, to wait the last point of the solution. So um, the last point of each batch element um, far more than the remaining solution points. Um, so we need to push um, the last um, points into the right um, solution. And this is something very similar um, to the multiple shooting um, regularization in the difficult flux examples. Um, so this is another best practice. Um, if we are using batching, um, so training on batch data needs to be forced in the, into a continuous solution on the batch element borders because this can become a real issue. You can have luck and there are some deviations uh, who are above and some they, um, sometimes we are too, too high, sometimes we are too low and this compensates for each other but in general uh, one should do something against it before it happens. Um, so let's go to the final point for now. Um, the almost last methodical chapter um, is basically just a mean, um, but nevertheless um, one of the most important things for today. Um, you need to do hyperparameter optimization um, when dealing with neural ODEs. Um, from my personal experience, um, I skipped this far too long. Um, for some of you, this might be super trivial, um, but it's important. Um, if I could travel back in time, good, there, there would be some things I would change, but one thing would, um, would to, to visit myself uh, two, two years ago and say, um, you do your hyperparameter optimization, because at this point, um, I did only something like empirical hyperparameter optimization, um, so trial and error, and this is just not efficient. Um, I could basically outperform every result I generated um, two years ago simply by just making a, a hyperparameter optimization. Um, so the final best practices, um, don't hope that it's working out of the box to hyperparameter optimization when dealing with neural ODEs. And the eight hyperparameters we are using um, for this use case today is the batch duration. Um, so how long in seconds is one batch element, the training duration, so how long um, do we want to train um, in, in the scale of the model. So a training duration of 100 seconds would equal a simulation of 100 seconds. Um, the um, parameter eta, beta one and beta two, you might know from the atom optimizer and that's the update rate, um, the first momentum, second momentum coefficients. And um, last weight um, determines how much we weight the last element um, in, the, in the batch um, compared to the remaining solution points. Loss, um, if, we talk, uh, if we want to take um, the mean average error or mean squared error. And the last thing is um, we have different schedulers pre-implemented. Um, there are, there are some more than the three, um, but um, yeah, it's only a, a quick insight. So um, there's a sequential and random scheduler. I, I bet you have a good idea of what this is. Sequential takes one batch element after another. Random takes a random batch element. The loss accumulation scheduler um, is interesting. We use it very often. Um, it is, um, um, you compute, uh, you accumulate a loss for every batch element 
during training. So the accumulated losses becomes, become um, greater and greater and greater. And for every training step, you use the batch element with the largest accumulated loss. Um, after you use it for training, you reset the loss to zero. So this way, um, elements with large losses are picked um, more often than those uh, with, with only little losses. But um, even elements with a very small loss um, don't starve. So they, they will be picked um, far, um, far less, but um, somehow um, at some point in time they will be picked even if the loss is only very small. Um, so these are the three schedulers we um, use. So let's finish coding. Yeah? Yeah. Um, we um, in the slide in the slide before we saw that it's very important to um, to try keeping our solu um, our chumps in solution between one um, two batch elements as small as possible. So one way to do this is to um, to rate the deviation of the last point much more than the other points. So um, last weight, um, think about last weight is um, zero, 0 0.7. Um, this translates into the last point contributes, the deviation of the last point contributes 70% to the error, whereas the remaining solution points only contribute 30%. So this is the idea behind. And by doing so, we can force that the solution, after we remove the batching system, um, hopefully is, um, is continuous at the points um, where the batch element borders were before. Mm -hmm. It can, it can be, yeah, yeah, it's continuous. You're right, um, but um, we diverge. Um, um, what, 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 what was that, that suggestion? We can jump back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, basically some some in direction of active learning approaches. Um, so we don't um, do a fixed separation before. We say um, for the first step we, we, we take this part and train for 10 seconds and the next time we take another part and train maybe for 12 seconds or so. When um, as soon as you go away from the fixed um, batching, you have, uh, don't have this problem. This is true. So. Um, so let's check the last two functions, uh, fu uh, functions for the day. Um, we start by implement, uh, implementing our loss function. Um, as input for our loss function, we have a solution, so a simulation solution object. Um, the FMU2 solution is very, very, um, um, it's, it's basically an ODE and uh, differential equations ODE solution. Um, the data, um, the data object we loaded in, the loss hyperparameter and the last weight hyperparameter. And we um, start by determining TS and TE, which is um, the indices in time, uh, and the indices for our data arrays um, corresponding to the time points of our solution. So we get the right part of data to the right part of our 
um, simulation solution and um, we retrieve the cumulative consumption from our neural ODE. This is done by FMI get solution state and we want the state number six, which is uh, cumulative consumption. Um, we get the consumption from, from data and the consumption deviation because as stated, we have two measurements and um, there's a small deviation between them. So um, if we're doing a loss comparison, it's important to allow a little deviation here. Um, and the remaining part is very uh, familiar to you, I think. Um, if we're doing a MAE loss or mean average error, we use a predefined function MAE last element relative deviation. This means we're using the mean average error to compare, but we weight the last um, element more with um, by the uh, factor last weight, and we allow a deviation of cumulative consumption deviation. And the very same applies to the um, MSE option here. So this is basically our loss function, and it's, um, it's not a very a very special one. Mm -hmm. So the train function. Um, we have a function um, for that. Um, we put in our um, hyperparameter array. So um, yeah, our hyperparameter array some resource because um, there are resource um, controlling hyperparameter optimization algorithms like hyperband which allocates different resources for different configurations and an index for the hyperparameter run. We fix our random seed, this is just for, um, for the notebook so we have always the same result. And um, our training duration is basically the resource um, that is determined we unpack our parameter array, so eta, beta one, beta two, batch duration, last weighting schedule, and loss um, from the hyperparameter array. We're starting our, um, we're printing that we are starting our um, training run and um, further load in the FMU. We build our neural FMU and um, we switch to a more efficient execution mode for this FMU. So by default, um, for every simulation run, there is an FMU instance allocated, but one can, uh, one can also simulate an instance and reuse it again and again and again, and this is basically what this command does. Um, for batching, there's a, um, a ready-to-use command in batch data solution. Um, you simply put in your neural FMU, a function that gives you start states for, for NEP because we need to determine start states for the ODE to be solved at every, every batch element start. Um, you put in the data um, time points and the actual data, um, our hyperparameter batch duration, we want to train only on the cumulative consumption, so we specify that index here. And we don't want things to plot, but this is actually very nice um, if you're working outside of a notebook. And um, FMU parameters and our progress bar. Um, we further specify an array, um, an, a dictionary, sorry, um, with additional solver keyword arguments. Um, I limited the maximum number of iterations here. So, um, by default, the um, FMU is doing 100 steps, um, at least 100 steps per second, and a thousand times batch duration allows the FMU basically to do 10 times, the neural FMU to do 10 times more steps than FMU. And if it's, the system becomes even more stiff, um, the solution process um, terminates, but that's okay because we don't want such a stuff, uh, stiff system. Um, the loss function um, is only dispatched in a, in, to a smaller um, argument footprint, so um, we want to call it just on a solution and um, want to fill data loss and last weight automatically. Um, this lines only, um, these lines only take um, um, 
allocate the scheduler we want to use. So we have the random scheduler pre-implemented, the sequential scheduler pre-implemented, and the loss accumulation scheduler pre-implemented. Um, but this is not that important at this point. So the loss function, um, the loss function does a simulation run on a batch element. So um, the loss function consists of um, the neural FMU, the batch we want to train on, um, the parameters, parameters are an input into the function, the parameters uh, we are training on, so as already stated, we're using the explicit parameter interface um, because it's just because it's more performant. Um, so um, parameters for the FMU, the loss function we defined above, so in the one that computes the accumulated consumption deviation. Um, which batch index we want to take, and th this value comes, of course, from the scheduler, so the scheduler element index changes over the training process. We want our log values to, uh, we want to lock our loss values, show a progress bar, and we put in the, the max iteration keyword argument from above. So the rest is very similar to training um, conventional um, artificial neural network, and we have flux params to extract trainable parameters from the neural FMU. We initialize the scheduler by calling initialize and um, allocate an instance of the atom optimizer with our um, hyperparameters, eta, beta one, and beta two, and call FMI flux train on the loss function um, we defined, the parameters we want to train on, the iterators repeated, um, which is which was originally for the data, but um, almost anyone is using it to do a specific number of steps uh, during training. So we are doing stepped optimization steps, and with the atom optimizer, we are located here. As gradient, we use forward diff um, because this system is very nasty. We have multiple events per time instance, so forward diff is the only thing that works um, good here uh, with a chunk size of. Uh, 32. After every step, we want our scheduler, to, our sch scheduler to be updated. We want our scheduler to be updated, and there's a keyword proceed on assert. So a search. So when um, a search throws because the system becomes unstable or similar, um, the training just um, goes on with the next step. So after this, um, we switch back to the original execution mode. We save the parameters of our training result, and um, we simulate the neural FMU and validation data so we can return this to the optimization process. So let's execute this function. Um, after that, we can... Um, call our training function and um, check the results as here. Um, but this takes a while and I think um, time is running fast. <laughs> so let's um, um, do it like the, um, like the chefs in TV um, and say I have prepared something. Um, and have a look on the results. Um, because I already did a hyperparameter um, optimization, I um, learned my lesson at this point. So um, we're loading in the FMU, building the neural FMU, loading the parameters, and the Julia Con 2023 parameter set, and um, simulating our neural FMU. We're simulating our FMU, so we can compare them to each other. It's actually always very nice. and. In this line, we plot the neural FMU, we plot the FMU results on cumulative consumption, and we plot um, the data trajectory. So, hopefully this will pop up soon. Um, that's a design restriction by FMI. So as stated, FMI are binaries. So I have, um, on Windows, I have a dynamic linker library 
and by and it's not impossible, but by um, the default cases that these DLLs are CPU specific. So um, we are trained to CPU as soon as we are using um, FMUs inside of this topology. But um, we can indeed do, um, do some multi-threading, uh, multi-threading or multi-processing. And this is totally possible and we use it um, we, it's a prototypical, a prototypical implementation in SMI Flux that uses, um, that uses um, multi-threading. So let's check out the results. Um, we have the neural FMU in blue, FMU in orange and beta in green. And um, as you can see, it's hard to distinguish between the neural FMU and beta um, at this point. So. Um, I did another plot which uh, focus, which is focusing on the, ah um, oh no, 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 before we come to that, um, we use a ready to use um, function that um, plots the, plots the um, error. Um, and as you can see, um, the mean squared error, the mean average error, and the maximum error is um, much, much, much lower, but more impressive is, um, as, yeah, numbers are somehow impressive, but um, I, I'm more the plot guy. So um, if we zoom in on the last 10% of the cycle, we see that um, the neural FMU is far closer to the data. And this was training data at um, the point. And it would only be fair if we have a look on validation data before we are cheering. Um, so these are the results on validation data. And as you can see, even here, we are far more better than the original simulation model. Um, and also at this point, um, we zoom in a little bit and we see, we see that uh, we are very, very good, um, actually. So um, if you're interested, yep. Um, we um, the the problem the problem is um, we are running out of data. Um, we 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 did uh, we did indeed talk about um, testing data, but um, there is none, and we we only have these these two WLTC driving cycles, and we could not uh, further cut it into into um, even more um, training sets. Um, but we we should uh, we did we did a test on um, there. This example is based on a publication from, from 2022, and there we had a, another driving cycle, and the common autonomous road driving cycle, um, which we use basically for testing data. And um, the results at this point were that um, we were far better than the original simulation model, but of course not, not as exactly um, as good as we were on training data. So um, there was a little bit more of deviation, but uh, you could clearly see that um, the right things are being understood. Um, yeah, for, the, for this tutorial, unfortunately, we only have the WLTC driving cycle. So um, testing is important, but, um, but we skipped it this time. So um, in numbers, um, the WMSE is uh, uh, the uh, mean squared error is um, has improved by a, fact, a factor of, 300, of around 300. Um, the mean average error by um, 22 and the maximum error by factor of 11, which is also very good. Um, finally, I have some, um, some sugar, <laughs> plotting sugar. Um, this is a plot showing um, the enhancements in um, that the um, hybrid model did make. Um, so what we are seeing here is the input space into the artificial neural network. So the acceleration, the consumption, and the velocity. Um, the colors in this plot are the, um, the enhancement we made um, in terms of the mean average error. So um, the greener we are, the better. So these are the um, points in the ANN's input space that we could 
um, enhance the most. And um, to be fair, there are some very little points that are slightly red, but um, these are, um, yeah, from um, the absolute values um, of slightly red is um, quite, quite low. So um, overall, we made um, a, a really, uh, have a bi big improvements here in prediction quality. So let's get to the final part. So now we are almost done. Um, um some last methodical thinking before we are finished for today. Um, even if we didn't use it uh, in the coding section for today, um, we have a very important methodical um, topic. Um, for this, we need a, um, short, a very short and surface level introduction in solvent and system stability. Um, for every dynamic system, um, eigenvalues can be computed, and the eigenvalues are these red crosses, basically. Um, one could plot, uh, plot them in a so-called complex plane, and um, they can be used for ODE system classification, like um, is the system stable? Um, the system is stable if all eigenvalues are on the left side of the complex plane, or does the system oscillate? Yes, it does oscillate if there are complex uh, co conjugate complex eigenvalue pairs like here. Or is the system stiff, and um, systems are considered stiff if um, very sloppy expressed uh, eigenvalues spread over a large range um, on the real axis. So if we want to watch our solution process of an ODE or a neural ODE, we can plot the ODE's eigenvalues um, together with the so-called um, stability region of the ODE solver. Um, to obtain a stable solution process, um, all, eigenvalues <coughs> all eigenvalues need to be inside of the stability region of the ODE solver. Um, if this is not the case, like it is here, um, the ODE solver can scale the eigenvalue positions relative to the complex origin. Um, by reducing its step size. So um, the step size control, as besides tolerance and order control, the step size control is basically um, um, the, the game of um, finding an optimal step size to have all my eigenvalues in size, uh, inside my stability region from the point of view of the solver. So, um, when we are training neural ODEs without further precautions, um, we almost always get one of the following warnings. Um, the dt is smaller or equal dt min. Um, if our eigenvalues are um, at positions that cannot be stabilized by reducing the step size, um, we can choose our step size as little as we want. We will never get this eigenvalue in the green, into the green circle. Or if the system is that, st uh, that stiff that we would need ridiculous little steps to get inside the stability region of the solver. Um, sometimes there's, um, there, for some similar problems, there's all, um, also um, this bad guy, um, instability detected. This is um, when the integrator state becomes not a number. 
Um, so these warnings um, later cancel the solution process and therefore the training of the neural ODE. And this is um, really, is, is a bad thing, but it's perfectly okay before, because it's right. And uh, the, the ODE solution cannot be retrieved in this case. Um, at the moment we are, we are using ANNs um, to describe dynamic systems. Um, we are playing with the system dynamics without think, thinking about things like conservation of energy and so on. This means um, we have no clue where our eigenvalues are placed and um, they could basically be anywhere. And even if we initialize our model um, with known eigenvalues position, uh, with known eigenvalue positions, there's no guarantee that between the initial solution of our neural ODE and the solution we want to be, that there is no instable um, solution between. So um, if we not consider eigenvalues during training of neural ODEs, um, we are basically just hoping that it's going well. Um, the larger the systems become we want to train, um, the lower are our chances that this is going well. So. Um, can we do something besides just hoping that um, that it works? And um, we can do something. And in theory, it's quite simple. Um, because eigenvalues are computed um, by calculating the Jacobian over the ODE, so the derivatives from um, the, der the derivatives from state derivatives to states, and this uh, so-called system matrix. And um, the eigenvalues of an OD system are the eigenvalues, the mathematical the eigenvalues of this Jacobian. So if we do these computations in a differentiable manner, um, we know how the parameters inside our ANN influence our system eigenvalues. And Doing so, we can simply define a cost function that um, force our eigenvalues in specific places. Um, for larger systems, um, we don't know the exact eigenvalue positions, but we could at least um, specify some ranges where we allow them to be and uh, impose some penalties as soon as they leaving these regions. Um, so let's conclude. <coughs> doing um, the eigen-informed, we call it, uh, I forgot to say, we call it this thing the eigen-informed neural ODE, there's a preprint on archive, and we are indeed using this training strategy um, to solve the presented issues. So um, by rating eigenvalues eigenvalue locations, we can prevent um, unwanted instabilities um, during the solution process of an ODE. And we can also prevent the system from becoming unnecessarily stiff. Unnecessarily stiff because sometimes the solution needs to be stiff to be able to match the data. But um, often the system becomes much more stiff than it, um, that it should be. Um, interesting, interestingly, we can share the Jacobian if we are using implicit solvers, um, which is almost um, almost any implicit solver needs um, Jacobian information. So we can pass the, the computed Jacobian to the implicit solver. Um, so one could argue that the Jacobian is basically for free if we already are using implicit solvers at this point. And um, we can do much, much more than just controlling stability and stiffness because um, there are other eigenvalue-related um, ODE properties like frequencies, um, damping, and a very interesting point is training on undersampled data, so data that doesn't fulfill the Nyquist channel sampling theorem. Um, but you can find a lot more ideas about this at the, at the archive preprint. Um, of course, it's not for free. Um, we did not make a benchmark yet, um, but computational costs for gradient determination over eigenvalue operations um, will increase um, the training time a little bit, um, but in many use cases for us it's about 50%. And one need to say that um, 
this um, deploying this technique even can reduce the number of training steps you need to take because you are not running uh, into unnecessary stiff um, system parts or um, even in a solution process that fails. So you are basically doing more valuable steps during training and this can under the um, at, in total, at the very end, um, even increase your training performance, even if it's more computational expensive than not doing it. So the corresponding best practices, um, if you have instability issues, um, this thing won't stabilize itself. Um, so eigenform training uh, may be a, an alternative if you are um, dealing with instability issues. Um, eigeninformed training is possible in Julia, but currently um, it's a little bit slow for discontinuous systems because we are still restricted to forward diff and finite diff because we are basically doing automatic differentiation over automatic differentiation for this. And um, this will become even more interesting in the near future because I um, heard that there will be a talk about um, Taylor mode differentiation in the Julia con, um, so a method to determine higher order derivatives in a fast manner, and this might be very interesting here too. Sure. Yeah, for, for forward diff over forward diff does work. Okay, uh, so, so we can use forward diff uh, to determine the diff Jacobian and the, um, and the eigenvalues of the Jacobian. And we can use forward diff also to do the entire gradient determination and this works. Um, but I don't know if there's any other configuration who's currently working for discontinuous ODE solving. Um, yeah. So, um, by the way, um, I don't know if, if this is um, possible today, but it is at the time we are doing, uh, we did this um, eigenform neural OD um, things. There was no way to differentiate um, over the eigen um, command in Julia, but I read some discourse, read that this might be um, implemented for now. Um, at this point, um, we, we, we did our um, uh, own little package which um, deploys sensitivities um, over eigenvalue operations, efficient sensitivities. So um, this slide is very quick. Um, there were some things we couldn't mention um, during timing restrictions, um, but they are too important to, to skip them, them completely. Um, one could drastically improve training performance by using initialization or often referred to as pre-training. So um, you can do collocation on this structure as well and um, or a neutral initialization which is even a little bit better than um, do, um, initializing it as uh, with identity. Um, batching is far not as easy as I showed it today. Um, with
with FMUs because um, there's a so-called discrete system state, um, which is not accessible from the outside. So um, we need to do some um, memory um, copy and paste um, stuff to get this working. Um, the Eigeninformed um, approach um, does offer so much more than just stability and stiffness. So this is only the pit of the Eigen iceberg, I called it. And um, there are much more interesting loss functions. Um, like we are also doing things with uh, soft dynamic time warping um, instead of uh, MSE or MAE. So um, results is just for completeness. Um, so they are also in the PDF version. Um, let's conclude what happened today. Um, we first, uh, I sum up all my best practices um, at, at one glance. So injection of knowledge, um, for example, in form of ODEs, enhances training speed, uh, converges, um, training convergence, and reduces risk of local minima. Um, we can use gates if we are not sure about the physical effect that is missing. Um, it is a good idea to keep the interfaces um, for the FMU as minimalistic as possible because every additional signal needs additional sensitivities um, that need to be computed. Um, if we are playing with system dynamics, um, we should be aware of um, not destroying the order of differentiation by the physical system. Um, ANNs and FMUs are two different things and uh, so they are the signal ranges between them and we need to transform um, between them. Um, when we do batching, and this is almost always the case, um, we need to do hyperparameter optimization before putting, um, before you think about putting your neural ODE at high to hyperparameter optimization. Um, so if, um, Exactly, and you may, and if you um, run into instability issues, um, just um, give the eigen-informed approach a try. Um, so force your system to be unstiff, stable, or any other OD properties. <coughs> One um, important thing remains, and the question was, um, we had the question already, um, does this only work for vehicle longitudinal dynamic models? And the answer is no. Um, we are using the presented workflow for different use cases in very different domains. Um, so I brought two examples. Um, the first is the hydraulic excavator arm. And um, in uh, mechanical engineering applications, often friction model, friction models are the part um, that is the most difficult to model because um, they're very easy friction models, but they are not accurate enough. And there are complex friction models and they are very hard to parameterize. So um, we tried um, learning for friction of an excavator arm um, on basis of a simple viscous friction model. And because this worked quite well, we did it also um, on a frictionless system. And this is what you see here. So it's basically, uh, a border stable system, it oscillates. And we stabilized the system and added the friction model um, with the presented neural FMU approach. And one very interesting point on this specific use case is, this, um, is that it's a real industrial application um, from a simulation company and they tried many other AI methods before and, and this was basically the first approach that lead to good results, as you can see. Um, more details um, about this on the Mobility Conference paper. Um, so the second one is an entire different um, domain. It's um, somehow from computational fluid dynamics in biological systems. So um, we simulate the human cardiovascular system here. Um, this was one of the very first use cases um, we did with physics enhanced neural ODs. And the goal in this part was not to increase accuracy, but increase speed. Uh, we wanted faster, we wanted models that are faster to evaluate. 
because um, as you know, CFD is quite expensive and takes a long time. So um, we trained uh, on basis of a very simple uh, steady state simulation. Um, this is the, the black values here that are that wrong that I even had to cut it in this plot. Um, on basis of this model, um, we trained the blue and red, um, the blue and green trajectories, um, which are two different type uh, topologies of neural SMUs, and um, we were able to um, to hit the arterial pressure pulse wave um, on the um, uh, iliac bifurcation, and it's the uh, part where where your legs start as well as on many other arterial segments. Um, but um, the clue is that this simulation model um, runs um, by a, fac a factor of 3,000 faster than the original CFD simulation. So in this use case, we did not boost accuracy. We boosted uh, simulation performance. So um, we further doing um, improved CFD simulations for 3D cabin models. Um, so an EC motor, motor and controlled EC motor um, controller simulation and um, it's uh, um, it's like a, a discretized belief system so it's it's a spatial discretized into, into an ordinary, uh, ordinary differential equation. Um, you know. So to conclude, um, this technique is not limited to electrical, mechanical, or biological systems. It's um, as versatile as neural ODs are. So um, it can be used for almost any dynamic system. Um, so. I really hope um, that some of these um, sticky notes will help you with your very own neural ODE application. Or maybe you just get a taste of um, neural FM, FMUs and ODEs and want to try it out. Um, I really hope to see much more neural ODE and hybrid neural ODE applications in the future because I um, think they really deserve it. It's a, such a cool technique. Um, where does the journey go? There's still work to do. Um, we are working on making things faster and more stable under the hood. Um, there are still multiple challenges um, when doing machine learning with industrial models um, that need to be faced. Um, for the future, we need a universal development pipeline for hybrid modeling in industrial scale. Um, we would wish for a little bit better um, sensitivity implementations in FMUs um, because as we already discussed, they are often not implemented at all or implemented by um, finite differences instead of just using symbolic Jacobians or automatic differentiation inside, which would be much faster. And um, on Julia's side, we need full support for fast sensitivities, uh, for fast sensitivity methods um, like backward automatic differentiation over discontinuous multi-event systems with um, further support for AD over AD so we can do this eigeninformed stuff very fast. Um, so um, that's it from my side. Thank you very much for participating. I had a lot of fun <laughs> and um, inter interesting three hours. And um, I really hope you had some fun too. Now we have some additional time for discussions um, if you want to stay, or we can have a talk at the conference, um, or beyond the conference, you can send me an email if you want. Thank you very much. <laughs>